Let's begin with prayer. Extravagant God, you are the source of our strength and the provider of our care. Help us hear your message for our lives this morning that we might believe in you afresh and find our souls restored and our hearts encouraged by your love as we humble ourselves to accept your guidance and your care. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and our redeemer. You may have heard of the miraculous stranded at sea survival story that played out earlier this year off the North Carolina coast. This is the true story of a man named Louis Jordan, a man somewhat down on his luck, out of work, and living on his boat, christened the Angel, normally moored safely in a marina in South Carolina. Jordan was a fisherman, though his dad says not a sailing expert. He had provisioned his boat for a six-day sailing trip in late January. Not long after Jordan left the Carolina coast to fish in the deeper waters off the Gulf Stream, he ran into some rough weather. The mast of his sailboat snapped in the ensuing storm and the boat capsized. Jordan had been asleep at the time and said he broke his shoulder as everything in the cabin flew upside down and sideways as the boat was hurled over by a gigantic wave. He managed to right the boat and get back inside, but all of his electronic equipment, the GPS, the radio, and any motor he might have had, were destroyed. With the pain in his shoulder, he could not repair the mast or do anything to sail the boat for days. All he had on board was a canned food supply and a 25-gallon container for water. That was it. He was stranded, dead in the water. But somehow he survived for 66 days at sea before he was discovered by a German freighter 200 miles east off Cape Hatteras, North Carolina. He was just drifting, directionless, like a toy boat bobbing on the waves. He would have liked our psalmist, the one who wrote the 23rd Psalm that I recited to you this morning that we recited together. The psalmist communicates an enormous sense of relief in knowing that the Lord is his shepherd, watching over him with a rod to fend off wild animals and a staff to keep him, and each one of us on the straight and narrow, as God would do. Were the ancient Israelites a seafaring people, they might have expressed God as a coast guard captain. But the shepherd of the flock was a more apt metaphor for the nomadic tribes. It would have been necessary in the hard scrabble countryside of Palestine to provide a grazing flock not only with protection, but also with food. Sheep need green pastures of abundant grass to eat and fresh water to drink. God provides us with these generous gifts, and our psalmist gives thanks to God, first and foremost, for keeping him alive. Without God's care and protection, without the abundance of food provided to us by God, without God's loving kindness, None of us would survive. The psalmist shouts this aloud, lest we take anything for granted. God's providence gave us our warm beds at night, our three meals a day, our relative ease of living in a place as 
beautiful as Port Jefferson right here on the north shore of Long Island, the psalmist reminds us to thank God and to recognize God as being the shepherd who not only feeds us, but who directs the very course of our lives. It was of interest to me that our sailor, Louis Jordan, was rescued during Holy Week. On Monday, Thursday, to be exact, it was the night when we remember the events that led up to the Last Supper, the final meal of Jesus with his disciples the night when he was betrayed. It was when Jesus gave up his body and blood for us in order to forgive our sins and provide us with the promise of eternal life. It is fitting somehow that Jordan was scooped out of the sea that merciful night, saved. Taken to a hospital in North Carolina immediately after his helicopter rescue, Jordan was remarkably healthy. Although he lost 50 pounds after his food ran out, he was in good condition, tired but alert. Yet skeptics wondered how he could have survived so long and come out of it not just alive, but seemingly in better health than when he left. Authorities checked Jordan's bank accounts to confirm that he didn't withdraw money during his time offshore, that he really had been stranded at sea. His credit card and bank statements showed no activity during his entire absence. We don't have any reason to doubt him, but nor can we confirm he spent all that time out there, an unnamed U.S. Coast Guard spokesman told a reporter. The Coast Guard medic said he would have expected Jordan to be dehydrated, unable to walk, sunburned, and malnourished. Even Jordan's shoulder now showed only mild bruising and a bump where it had been broken. After two months, it healed, Jordan explained patiently. God knows I am a truthful man. My family knows I am telling the truth. The people who know me know that. Jordan said he spent much of his time praying, praying for rain and for rescue, praying to God to protect him, feed him, provide him with fresh water to drink. He said he read the Bible cover to cover. I'm guessing he came back to the 23rd Psalm more than a few times. Even though I walk in the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. But there's more to this psalm than abundant, never-fail, life-sustaining provision. There's an embodiment of God's mercy and kindness that turns enemies into friends, that eliminates all threats and makes table fellowship a place of safety and reconciliation. The psalmist addresses God directly now, giving honor to the God who prepares a table in the presence of of the psalmist's own enemies. The strike is gone. The enemy's anger is muted, and even he is welcomed in, no longer a threat, thanks to the life-changing love of our ever-faithful God. Now God anoints the psalmist's head with oil, like an honored guest, like the prodigal son, welcomed home by the father with a cloak and a ring and the fatted calf to feast on. Sometimes the shared meal of compassion takes us by surprise when we discover ourselves showered with abundance in the midst of our scarcity. I found this to be true in reading Anthony Dewar's wonderful new novel, All the Light We Cannot See, a book I highly recommend to you. It tells the story of a blind French girl living under the German occupation of France during World War II. 
She has survived in a secret place of refuge in the walled seaside town of San Malo. As confused fighting between liberating Allied forces and desperate German occupiers begins, she is discovered by a young German soldier, a teenage boy himself. He had learned French as a young child from a French woman who took care of him. Now, confronted with a choice to save the girl or destroy her, he chooses mercy. And without saying more about the story, I want to share with you the moments when the two find themselves thrown together in hiding and under siege from the Allied bombing that now takes place to liberate the town. Neither of them has eaten in days, and they are on that precipitous tipping point between life and death, freedom or failure. Dewar describes it this way. It's morning. The window glows. The slow, sandy light of dawn permeates the room. Everything transient and aching, everything tentative. To be here, in this room, high in this house, out of the cellar with her, it is like medicine. I could eat bacon, she says. What? I could eat a whole pig. He smiles. I could eat a whole cow. The woman who used to live here, the housekeeper, she used to make the most wonderful omelets in the world. When I was little, he says, we used to pick berries by the Ruhr, my sister and me. We'd find berries as big as our thumbs. The, girls, the girl crawls into the wardrobe and climbs a ladder and comes back down clutching a dented tin can. Can you see what this is? There's no label. I didn't think there was. Is it food? Well, let's open it and find out. With one stroke from the brick, he punctures the can with the tip of the knife. Immediately, he can smell it. The perfume is so sweet, so outrageously sweet that he nearly faints. What is the word? Pesh. Like pesh. The girl leans forward. The freckles seem to bloom across her cheeks as she inhales. We will share, she says, for what you did. He hammers the knife a second time, saws away at the metal, and bends up the lid. Careful, he says, and passes it to her. She dips in two fingers, digs up a wet, soft, slippery thing. Then he does the same. The first peach slithers down his throat like rapture, a sunrise in his mouth. They eat, they drink the syrup, they run their fingers around the rim of the can. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. This is the love of God at work in the world. When our eyes are open to our shared humanity and we share sustenance, the sweetness of a can of peach, a miracle find in a famine, we share these meals together for no reason but sheer gratitude, in gratitude to God, the Good Shepherd, who feeds us still. Yet, there is a message even more extraordinary in this 23rd Psalm. Something you would never discover just by looking at it in your Bible at home. In our translation of the final verse, the one that goes like this, Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. In our translation, 
And in every English translation I found the King James, the New International Version, the reliable NRSV. Goodness and mercy are always described as following the psalmist. But that's not what the original Hebrew says. The original Hebrew language psalm says something significantly different. It says that the goodness and mercy of the Lord shall pursue us, shall track us down, and chase after us all of our days. It's not the kind of mercy and goodness that follows us at a distance, hanging back in your shadow, taking its own time. God's love and kindness, God's mercy and goodness are going to chase you all the way home. You can't escape God's love even if you try. It's going to shepherd you along from behind, guiding you forward, close on your heels, until you arrive like a child come home into the welcoming arms of a loving parent, of God the Father, reunited once and for all in one big, loving, and merciful hug. Now this is what being pursued by mercy can look like. Remember our stranded sailor, Jordan? Well, one of the many interviews held after Jordan's rescue was with his father, who described the younger Jordan to curious reporters as having a very strong constitution. He is strong, his father said, not only physically, but also spiritually. And he told me on the phone from the rescue ship that he was praying the whole time. So I believe that sustained him a great deal. Apparently Jordan drifted in the Atlantic, rationing food and water until his shoulder healed. And he was then able to rig a makeshift mast and sail. But he said he could not make much headway against the currents. It took so long, he told the reporter. It moved so slowly. And there were more storms. The boat capsized two more times before he was rescued. And finally, when his food and water ran out, survival became more urgent. At first, the fish weren't cooperating, but after a while, Jordan learned that they were attracted to his laundry that he would put out to sea for a rinse and the fish would swim in and out of his clothes, and he could easily scoop them up with a hand net. He told reporters that he survived by eating fish he caught in the ocean and by catching rainwater in a bucket. He said the water he drank tasted pretty good, like coconut milk. And of course, he prayed without ceasing. Maybe it was a miracle. Maybe it was the Good Shepherd, or both. Miracles do happen, especially when you put your faith in the Lord, our God, our Savior, or who pursues us, relentlessly tracking us down with goodness and mercy to give. Time and again, even to the ends of the earth, even across the vast spread of the seas. Oh, and by the way, Jordan's boat, the angel, it's still out there somewhere. It's not been seen since Easter weekend when Jordan was raised up from it, a new man. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen.